Hey, um, welcome to the Overshare Pamphlet. My name is Rob, and I'm the host of this one-man show. I am here on this fine day, first first week, actually, of October as well. So I was uh, literally talking to my colleague the other day, and we both like realized at the same time that like, well, like 2024 is almost over like we just have literally three months left we're ringing in the last quarter of the year and it's insane because like 2024 to me like it seems like it just started yesterday or something so i'm quite in a way anxious the year is ending because you know there were so many you know things going on and i'm like i don't want to like you know i don't want to move on to the next year um i don't know it's just like the usual feeling of when like a year ends i guess like of in a way, being glad that this year is has gone and like nothing ma- major happened in in that sense, but also anxious that times is like like times like these like move so fast and yeah, and so on that same wavelength, I guess I was inspired to do this episode today. It's a bit of an interesting one, unusual, I guess, uh, because uh, I won't be giving you my songs of the week because today I'm going to be talking basically the entire episode about music so um what am i talking about i'm going to be basically giving you guys my top five projects like eps or albums of the year that were released this year my personal ranking uh so these this five albums will be um ranked top one and whatever uh and i'm also going to be giving you guys my favorite 10 songs and i'm not gonna rank them because i don't want to rank them for these ones because it's so difficult i think with songs to pick an absolute favorite over everything else but for an album i think it's a bit more it's a bit easier because you have an entire project a variety of songs on one project and you can like easily i guess in a way um rank albums in terms of like which project specifically had the most you know, relatability or, like, I'll, I'll get also into, like, what criteria I've used to, like, you know, select these songs and rank these albums, but, yeah, so I just wanted to, like, I don't know, give a little throwback to the, the year, and also you may say, like, why didn't you wait for, the like, for December or something, or, like, literally the end of the year to do this, well, well, I don't know, I just, like, been so stuck on this idea this week, I just couldn't get it, I, I was thinking of doing other episodes today, like, for this week, but... I was just like, my brain was spinning. I just kept on thinking about this the whole time. And also I think, to be fair, that... I mean, while there is still some stuff that is going to be released, it seems that, you know, I already have so much good stuff um, in my playlists and everything else. You may know I literally, like, explore music so much. (laughs) Every fucking week, I literally have dedicated playlists, which you should check them out, of course. Like, every month, you can just go back and, you know, check all the playlists of the month for the Overshare pamphlet. But, yeah, I don't know. I think this is, like, a provisional, uh, like, ranking slash, you know, list. Things could change. Things always change in my brain all the time. But this, in this exact moment, this is what I'm feeling that I want to, like, convey to you guys. And I think, to be fair, there is one specific song that made me kickstart this whole entire fucking, like, episode. And I'll get to that song when I'm, you know, going through the through my list. But, yeah. Um, anyways, you can check out any episodes from my podcast uh, on Spotify and every podcast ever you could, like, possibly think of. And... I am putting out an episode each week, every Monday at 6 a.m. in the UK. You can convert your time zones, of course, but every Monday in the UK, I guess, <laughs> at 6 a.m., I am putting out an episode for this podcast. So in case you're, you know, looking for forward to the next episode, I guess, just, you know, watch out for next Monday. Every Monday, a new episode and new songs and new topics and all fun uh, things related to that. So stay tuned and just you know maybe get your notifications on for my podcast if you want but yeah so how to begin how to begin this entire (laughs) crazy ass project um i would say i would like this is literally like difficult it's like choosing between your favorite children but (laughs) it's the truth it's the truth it's like you know you have specific memories associated to like specific 
projects, EPs, albums and songs and you have really a hard time, I guess, coming to terms with them and also ranking them or like listing them out. It's just terrible. It feels so cold cut, but I have to do it. And not because anyone, everyone, like, you know, anyone else is like forcing me to, but yeah. Anyways, I want to start with the songs, I think. I want to do the 10 songs. These, as I said, like, they're not ranked, but they're just listed because um, I don't think there is a any possible way of me like giving y'all a an accurate ranking of of ten songs from this year. I think things change in terms of preferences. With the albums, I, I think it's more a bit more set in stone because I've had more time to like sit with all these projects and I kind of have an idea of like which I literally prefer the most over everything else. So that was easier for me. But this the song the songs themselves are a bit. They're like very individual, you know, and individual pieces here. So it's a bit more difficult. So spare me with this. Uh, anyways, enough rambling. So yeah, how did I choose these songs? I think the way I went about it was, well, first of all, it's a, it's a mixture of things, I guess. First, I, I started checking through my, well, it's this app called um, stats.fm which is also a website, I believe, but they also have an app, which I have to keep, like, you know, keep track of my stats, my um, my musical stats. But I went through my most replayed songs of the year, of 2024, and then I started skimming through them, seeing which songs were, like, you know, released this year, and, like, you know, because I, I listen to a lot of songs also from the past, of course, so uh, I needed to, like, you know, have a proper... Uh, list of songs that were released this year that I listened to a lot but that doesn't mean that they were my favorite ones as well this, this is what I'm trying to get to these were statistically what I've listened to the most but you know a song you can listen to a song a lot maybe because it's stuck in your head or like there's plenty of different reasons for why you do that um, or if you're a stan you, you stream songs to like you know support your favorite artists but I think also the the other part I, I did a right uh, route I guess I tried to like uh, walk on in a, in a way was um, trying to um, pile up the songs that objectively I think are very innovative in my mind or very like you know perfectly produced in terms of production literally or like lyrically they are outstanding for me in my books of course this is all my opinion so y'all don't have to like drag me in the fucking comments please or on twitter don't drag me into this but this is just my personal ranking so if you don't like you know agree then it's your opinion it's your motherfucking opinion but this is also my opinion so respect that if you're listening to my episode then you need to be prepared to like listen to my opinion anyways but yeah so i sort of thought about like what makes a song outstanding in my opinion and what is objectively something that really stood out in my mind right i mean there's no pure objectivity in these things because uh, it's coming from my mouth basically but i try to be as objective as i could in my own you know personal list basically um so yeah i guess let's start off with the first song on this list um I want to start off with Collateral Damage by Christian. I still don't know her, how to pronounce her name. Christian. Christy. I don't know. Christian. Christian, I guess. That's how you pronounce it. I hope so. But she's a very, 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 very small artist, I guess. Um, she interacted with me this year on TikTok as well when I posted this specific song, actually. And I begged people to go and listen to it. Because this song is the motherfucking jam. It's really, really good. Actually, it's very depressing in a way. Um, so also, the, the problem with this... Um, with the artist being this uh, small in that sense, it's a bit more difficult to like actually see any sort of conversation around the song to understand what actually the concept of the song is about. So it's pretty much up to interpretation here and my own interpretation here plays a big role i guess even genius has the lyrics on but they were like written by a, fa a fan so i don't even know if the, the lyrics are entirely correct and there's no input from the original artist on what the song actually means as far as i know so yeah 
this take it with a grain of salt but the first element of the song that really 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 like hooked me on it was the production i think when i put it in my songs of the week back in whenever i discovered the song i i think it must have been february the beginning of the year or as well maybe but anyways uh, i think i said also back then that the electric guitar in the song, like, the, the the guitar, it's a bit rockish, uh, it's, it's a bit rock, I guess, but what really, like, drives me nuts about this fucking song is the way this electric guitar picks up so heavily and so intensely in the choruses, and out of nowhere, because you cannot, like, I cannot explain it, but you cannot actually, you cannot actually, like, predict... You can actually like put a finger when the song is picking up, but it just like smoothly picks up eventually. Like it doesn't start picking up during the pre-chorus. That's how a normal pop song goes. Like it'll go like the pre-chorus usually is the one that sets you up for the chorus, right? But it feels very much here that the entire verses and everything in general before the chorus preps you up for the chorus and it slowly leads you into it. So it's just so fucking masterful the way it's done. I just cannot explain it. It's just so good. It's just a feeling that I have whenever I listen to a song. It's just crazy. And that's what, like, that's what makes me, like, reach out for this song specifically. Because whenever when I, re I like, experience this sort of feeling of, like, build-up and anticipation, I listen to this. Then the lyrics, I guess. That's also a fun part of it. I think it's part of why I really like the song is that since it's not really set in stone what it is about... I think I just came up with my own interpretation of it. And hear me out. It's actually quite interesting, I think. Very unique. But so the 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 song talks a lot about, you know, the chorus specifically goes a lot into like, I just wanted you to let me fall apart. I just wanted you to basically leave me alone in a way, in my own misery. That's what I'm thinking about, basically. Then she also says, I just needed you to clean up the blood for once. And if we turn out the lights, I don't know what uh, how I'll manage. Maybe the rest is collateral damage, right? Um, so then this is like in sharp contrast with the verses, I guess. And the bridge specifically, I think, reveals quite a lot. But the verse, the first verse, for example, she says, If you look out of the house, I guess you'll leave. I'd still want snow in the driveway where your car would be. So it's kind of like, you know, she's afraid of this person leaving and she would want something... Um, stopping him from leaving in a sense and in the second verse she also says and i've been in the waiting room for so long when i finally see the sky i don't know how i want to know how to respond right so she wants to be left alone left alone in her misery she wants to be left alone in this very low state that she's in but she also doesn't want the other person or significant other i guess to leave her in that sense right um, and I think that's when we hit jackpot, is when we got to the bridge, she says, It's accidental, I break you, you follow, hold your problems in my palm, I'm so tired, but I know, I want, but I want you now. And then she goes into the outro, which is, again, I just wanted you to let me fall apart. So I think, like, it's this dichotomy of, like, you know, um, hurting someone because of how you're feeling and wanting to be left alone as well in, in, at the same time, like, being left in your own misery, but at the same time as well, not wanting the person to go. It's just a very, I don't know, I think people can relate to this in a way, because it's just, like, an unexplainable feeling and a very selfish way of behaving in a way as well, but you just, you just cannot, you know, maybe you're in a state where you cannot communicate your emotions clearly, and you just want to be left in rotting, but also feel the presence of someone near you but without necessarily, like, having that person influence the way you're feeling, you know? Like, trying to make you feel better in that way. It's a very, as I said, like, it's a very selfish way of behaving, because it's, like, you know, not fair on the other person whatsoever. But also, it's such an inexplainable feeling that I think I've personally been through this as well. Like, I'd want someone specifically near me, but at the same time, I'd want to be left alone. And it's just, like, a very conflicting, I guess, situation, so... Very, very interesting. That's my understanding as that. Like, it's not really set in stone. I don't even know if, like, I'm on to something. But maybe I am. I don't know. But anyways. Great fucking song. Great fucking song. Then. I want to talk about... Um, Never Need Me by Rachel Tinoriri. I don't know how to pronounce her surname. Tinoriri. I don't know. But she is... 
just incredible. Her voice is just like one of a kind, I think. It's like very soft, but also very emotional. Um, and the song is very poppy, very uh, pop. I guess there are some like punkish elements to it, but it's mostly pop, I would say. And it the the way is just like the melody is laid out is just like a very uh, freeing song in that sense. Like the it, it matches well the content of the song, I guess. And I think it's just like elevated by the way she sings it and the way she delivers the lines. But also lyrically, lyrically, I think it's like a very um, like oh, uh, in a way like very cool song like a very relatable track um so let me get into the lyrics of it all well i mean from the title itself you can actually like already tell that it's about you know wanting to wanting someone to never need you again right and it's exactly about that so it's like basically through the verse and the choruses basically it's clear it's clear that um the relationship between her and this other person didn't really work out because this person, was, this person was bringing her down, right? Um, and she has this, like, sort of... Uh, like, this is a song that was written clearly, like, after some time this thing was over. So there is a bit of a perspective, I guess, here. That's very, you know, freeing as well. Um, and she is basically, like... It, if you can change, I doubt that I can help you. I've made plans and sorry, I'm there without you. Like, you've now distanced yourself so much from a person that was clearly not good for you. And you wanted to do your best to be there for them. But this person kept on just, you know, dragging you down and not letting you help them in that sense. Um, so now in the chorus, she goes basically like, in my head, you can do whatever you like. I don't care. I couldn't care what you do with your life, I hope you just take it easy, and I hope that you never need me, um, maybe I'll regret not sticking around, but how can I swim if you're pulling me down, just promise you'll take it easy, I hope that you never need me, like, it's basically wishing the best to the other person, and it's clearly someone that you, like, understand so well, and you also understand at the same time very well why you left them in the first place, because, you know, you love them so much, but you cannot be around them anymore, because they cannot, you know, they don't want to be helped and they want to be, you know, dragged. They, they want to drag you down with them in that sense. Like, it's just unhealthy, not really, you know, there's no future there. But I gotta respect my girl because she literally said, you know, I just hope you take it easy and I hope you, you never need me. Like, you know, she's still wishing this person the best despite, you know, um, all the shit that she's been through, right? Um... Like, verse 2, for example, she says, You say I'm the love of your life, but now it just isn't the time. You're doing it again. This is why your cycle never ends. You're addicted to trouble, to the trouble you choose. I'm surprised you're even confused. I know you'll never learn what the hell am I supposed to do. So basically, like, she's just saying, like, you know, you are literally are, like, right now, you don't even know what you want, basically. You just keep on saying that you want me, but also you don't. And it's just, like, you know, a very confusing situation. And, you know, I, I, I just got to walk out. I just got to, like, get get going you know i just gotta chop chuck the deuces how aj would say but yeah um she just wants i just like find it so emotional as well the way she gets to the last post chorus she, she just keeps on saying like i just just promise me you'll take it easy i hope that you never need me i just promise you know i just promise you'll take it easy and it's just you know so bittersweet so complicated as well because you are so you know second guessing yourself in a way but at the end of the day you just know that you, the love you had for that person is very genuine and you want them to just you know find their peace but you also know that you cannot be part of that because you also need to guard yourself and be in your peaceful space so yeah what a fucking sad anyways that's done um now let's go to a double, I want to do, like, the, these two songs back-to-back. -back. Slim Pickens and Please, Please, Please by Summer Carpenter. Now, here I could give you, since they're from the same album, I could give you 
my personal rank ranking between the two. Like, if I were to be completely biased, I would say Slim Pickens. But objectively, I still believe that Please 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 the best track she's ever put out, period, on the album or any album she's ever made. Like, production wise and lyrically and everything is just incredible. I just watched the Variety episode with Jack Antonov where he broke down the, the song itself and it's just a masterpiece. It's just so well done. But let me get first into Slim Pickens. Slim Pickens, if you didn't like listen to my um, review, which is out for, uh, you know, Short and Sweet, the uh, new album by Silver and Carpenter, just go listen to it as well if you want to get a bit of more in-depth uh, review of that but um slim pickings is just very country coded from the banjo to everything else and lyrically is just so starky and funny and what makes sabrina sabrina basically she's just so funny funny um she goes into like you know the troubles of dating in your 20s i guess which is basically um, fixating yourself on the idea of someone that you cannot have, um, and then start you start overthinking and going to these old like you know thoughts about like you know maybe you're you you'll end up alone like this life is just like it doesn't have any surprises for you, and you know I, going through so many dates and all, so many different people and like you know old douchebags in my phone playing like a slot machine you know you just keep on going on like these. Um, you do this like speed dating thing and never finding the one basically and then also being sort of you know that's where she gets funny like in the record she says for example i just want a boy who's checked and kind can find his ass to save my life you know and then she realizes she's so self-aware and says like oh it's slim slim pickings if i can have the one i love like i said i'll just like you know i'll be kissing you just to like you know get my fixing it's just insane like so very smart very funny very snarky incredible i think it's like um outstanding in terms of like the songs that have been released this year because it's so you know on the nose and serious but also doesn't take itself too seriously and it's just very effective it's very animated as well and plus on top of that it's just another jack production jack antonoff production just the the composition the core changes and everything like the the production, the acousticness of it all it is very acoustic, uh, acoustic guitar and a banjo and everything. So it's a very like down to the roots type of like um, country song, which makes me more excited for what Jack is going to do with uh, Lana Del Rey on Lasso, the country album, which apparently still is happening, which I'm glad about. But anyways, um, yeah, incredible track. And on the same vein, Please, Please, Please is the same literally type of uh it's I would I'd venture say like please 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 is also a very country esque song, but it's just like upgraded in that sense. Like it combines country elements like an acoustic guitar with a very synthes uh synthy eighties um type of production as well. And in the variety episode that I was talking about, he says that he was very much inspired by like you know Dolly Parton and ABBA and a lot of like you can feel like it's like a Frankenstein type of track between the two but it just like blends so well together and again the writing here as well is just um so snarky as well but also so serious but also so not non like you know so unserious as well it's just incredible um so for example let me give you some like highlights um Yeah, I heard that you're an actor, suck like a stand-up guy, whatever devil is inside you, don't let him out tonight. I'll tell him it's just your culture and everyone rolls their eyes, you know, all I'm asking is that you shouldn't prove them, prove them right. Like, don't bring me to tears when I just did my makeup so right, you know, it's just like, she's, she's being silly, but she's also being, like, serious, like, bitch, don't prove them right, don't disappoint me, right? Um, heartbreak, is one, heartbreak is one thing, my ego is another, um... I beg you don't embarrass me, motherfucker. Motherfucker. That motherfucker is country. I've been talking to my friends about it. Like, we talked, uh, like, a couple of months ago about this. But that motherfucker, the way she says it, it's so country. So you cannot tell me this is not country. But as I was saying, like, this is the same vein as Slim Pickens. But I think what takes it to the next level is the actual production. It's just insane. Like, she just goes off on this song. It's just so... Like, and there's that key change from A to C, I think it is. 
in the second verse, I believe, um, that is so unexpected, elevates the song, it gives a little bit of a change in the, in the direction of the song, in the mood and everything. It's like a little surprise and like, um, like it makes you raise your eyebrows basically, but it's just incredible, just incredible stuff. Um, and that's that goddamn synth is just so fucking good. I beg you to go and like watch that episode um, on Variety. I think Jack Antonoff can explain it hundred percent better. And that's what I mean. Jack Antonoff is that motherfucking bitch. Like he's so versatile. He can just do so many different things. Like go like see what he did on Taylor Swift's uh, The Torture Boys Department, and then go see what he does with Lana or any other uh, other artist. He is so versatile, and he can just like do the best thing ever. Um, it just pops off and it's just such a perfectionist and just gets everything so well mastered as well like it's just incredible just kudos to him but yeah those are two Sabrina songs so that's how how many songs have we done we've done four already so um then my next song I want to talk about is Don't Wanna Break Up Again by Ariana Grande now hear me out this is the only song I've put where I also have included the album in my top uh albums of the year as of now and there's a reason for it like that this song is just so good um i think it's also very unique i don't know if i can like pinpoint to any other song from ariana grande that reminds me from from her catalog that reminds me of this one while other songs in um eternal sunshine can remind me of like other stuff from ariana previously this specifically is just so unique and so Yet again, so Ariana. I don't know. It's just like very interesting. Um, the production itself is very like bubbly and very like you know groovy and just an, a nice beat and like it's something that you like you know it's very infectious. Um, but I think it's just like Ariana. What does best I think is just the, the combination of her the way she stacks her vocals and her harmonies. Um, and also, just a pure raw talent in terms of like actual vocals. The way she sounds on a track is just uh, like unmistakable. Like unmistakable, you cannot literally mistake it for anyone else. Um, so, yeah, let's get into like some of these lyrics. Um, but this is basically about you know a situation ship that it's a very complicated song, I guess. Like in terms of lyrics, I would say. Um, like, you're in, no, well, Ari is talking about basically being in this, like, situationship, this relationship, I don't know how, what it is specifically, but, um, she knows that they're both not really compatible for each other, and here she takes, um, ownership of, like, doing things wrong in a way, and, like, being detrimental to the other person's, um, happiness, and so she would want to end things with them for their own safety, for their own, like, well-being, but also she doesn't do it because, she doesn't want to. She doesn't want to break up again. You know, she just is sick of breaking up all the time, and she just wants to be in something stable. So it's that very relatable sort of situation where you keep on seeing someone that you know is not good for you, but like, and you know you're not good for them at the same time, and you just don't want to. I just like love the self awareness of this song. Like, it's just crazy. And also, how does she go from like the first verse saying that this guy is just overburdened by her crying in a room and so she just, it just has to like turn up the tv to just avoid like hearing her cry like that's me as shit from the guy's part but then she goes into the the rest of the song and she's just like oh uh, i don't want to fuck with your head um it's breaking my heart to uh, keep breaking yours again the situation the situation she passed the hand um uh, i don't want to break up again though so i'm not gonna do it <laughs> um I guess it's like in a way also a bit ironic maybe because like in some other pre-courses she's like I'm 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 in the pre-course she says like I'm too much for you, so I really gotta do the thing I don't want to do. So I I think the point she's driving home here is that she thinks that she's too much for this person, she's just overburdening them and like her emotional state. Oh wow, <laughs> like this kind of like a lot of damage by uh, the one the first song I was talking about uh, by Christian, but yeah. Oh, that. See, now I'm realizing again why am I doing this to myself? Why am I putting out these songs? Because 
<laughs> he's gonna expose myself, the way I think about things, the way I relate, to, the things I relate to, my own experiences and everything else. And I don't want that now, but it's too late. It's gonna go in. Um, but yeah, it's a very, I think, a, re a very relatable um, sort of, um, you know, situation that everyone found more. I hope at least I'm not the only one who finds themselves in like the, these type of things. But yeah. And then I think in the bridge, she does allude to like actually in the end breaking up with this person. But it's just like a very, you know, emotive song. Very cool track. Max Martin here does an incredible job. The way he produced this one was just so good. And I just love the intro, for example, as well. Like, her vocals, like, sort of, like, leading you into the song. And then it's just this, like... I think that the, the, what, the very captivating thing about this, the production is just, the, like, this constant drum or, like, beat, uh, whatever snare that goes in. Like, it keeps on being thrown into her song. Um, so, yeah. Just... Masterful, masterful. I'm gonna get more into like you know Eternal Sunshine when I get to the album, but just know it's on that on that list as well. Now we have fuck, it's already 31 minutes. This episode is gonna be long. Um, so we've done slim pickings, but don't want to break up again. Here is one, two, three, four. We're all, we're number six, I guess. Um, Blue Moon by Nikki. Um, Blue Moon by Nikki. Interesting. Now, I put this song in. I would say, like, I am conscious that this song, like, production wise, is not maybe the um, greatest thing that was ever invented. But I think what I really, 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 really enjoyed about this was just the lyrical ability of Nikki, the way she just works best at. I think when she talks about relationships and the way she's able to like convey a message in so like so few words um is just insane and here she uses the metaphor of like a blue moon which is like a very um a rare event and she's basically saying that this person is her one that got away basically um and that this person she met this person she was the right well this person was the right person at the wrong time and that basically you know she still wonders about this person and how um things might have worked out differently if they met at another time maybe it could have been the one right um sounds like Taylor Swift but anyways um like literally anything in terms of lyrics about the song just it's just my fucking brain I don't know what how to explain it but for example let me Get you into the verse one, the way the songs like like the, the song itself opens up, right? Um, take it from the wolves to make it out of the woods together is an is an art. We couldn't do such a thing. We were too afraid of the dark, right? So immediately it's telling you that, um, like you know, she's putting you into a position where you know that um, she couldn't like you know, sir, like this relationship was doomed to fail, basically, right? That you know, like. To make it out of the woods together is just an incredible thing, an incredible feat. Uh, like, a, a lone wolf cannot survive, right? So, he, 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 like, the wolf needs another, you know, needs a pack to survive, right? And that's the beauty the beauty of it, like, the, the shared uh, commitment and the shared survival, right? But they couldn't do that thing. Like, they couldn't get to that point. They couldn't find this commitment. Um, and so... They never made it out of the woods as well, which is the very interesting thing here that, like, you know, the very li link here. Like, to make it out of the woods together is an art, but we couldn't do such a thing, so they could never actually escape this, right? That like they're still in this confusional state in the woods, right? So, interesting. Then she goes into pre-chorus, which is so good. So you drove far, far away from me. Uh, sorry. You just... So you drove far, far away from the life that we built, brick by brick, just until we were swept up in the cruelest cyclone. All my eyes were glued to yours as we chose to ignore the rattling floorboards. Now I'm sleeping alone, right? So they knew, both knew that, like, we're going to... At that end, basically. But they just 
like ignored this entire like you know warning sign and it just kept on going until they literally ended up basically separating and just you know maybe not speaking to each other again and then the chorus is like the magnum opus of the song i think and it goes into like this very jammy bass line it's so good it's just a simple bass line into the song but it's just carried by her vocals as well the way she sings uh it's just so captivating as well but she sounds like you know tired and disillusioned or whatever but it's just so good four full laps around the sun we wouldn't admit we were done no um now i may uh, very well as just lost the one i'm a january baby you were born in june a, an ice cold bitch when you burn like noon was it hidden in the cards that I'd lose you? Was it written in the stars that we'd meet a little too soon? Um, just masterful. I just love, you know, four full laps around the sun. Basically, it's like saying you know, it's four, four years, right? Um, just an incredible way of, like, you know, instead of saying literally four years, she's saying four full laps around the sun. It's such a good way of portraying, the, you know, the, the passage of time. And we wouldn't admit that we were done. So in this whole four years, they kept on going like back and forth, and they like she, they both knew as I said like they were not working, but they kept on lying to themselves, right? And then she goes fast forward to today after the breakup, saying now I may very well have just lost the one. So she's thinking back on it and saying, well, that was probably my person, but we just at that point in time we were not working out, but yeah, like. She thinks still that he was the one that got away, right? And then she goes into, like, the best... My favorite line, hands down, of the song. I'm a January baby, you were born in June. An ice cold bitch, when you burn like noon. So in this, like, very simple line, one single line, she manages to, like, describe both person and the entire situation... Like, the entire relationship in just a few words. It's just masterful. I'm a January baby, you were born in June. An ice cold bitch, when you burn like noon. You are, like, at the opposite sides... He's a very, you know, warm and, like, you know, um, pleasant person, like a very extroverted type of, like, and a very affectionate type of person where she's very guarded and sort of cold-hearted, like, very, very, you know, like, careful and um, her guard is always up, basically, right? So, and then she says, a nice cool bitch, exactly, when you burn, like, noon. So you're, you're so, you're, you're both so different so that's probably why you couldn't, like, you guys couldn't have worked, right? So good. And then she says, like, was it in the cards that I'd lose you? Was it written in the stars that we'd meet just a little too soon, right? So she's saying, like, well, we were just so different. We couldn't have made it work. Like, she knows that was, that was the issue, basically. And so she blames it on the, des like, the cards, basically, right? On the fate, basically, that they just meant a little too soon. They were just so different at that time. They, they could have never worked. But, yeah. I'll leave you to get maybe, maybe like get into the rest of the song because the, the choruses and the uh, pre-choruses and everything, the verses, just lyrical masterpieces. But yeah, incredible stuff. Now let's get into track number seven. Um, Beaches by Biba Doobie. Now this song, oof, it's an odd one out, I guess, because like lyrically is doesn't have to do with any relationships, doesn't have to do with, like, anyone that got away, doesn't have to do with any situationships, doesn't have to do with any, like, sort of depression or low points in your life, so let's get out of the way, <laughs> thank God, for a nice, like, change of pace, I guess. Um, this is also rockish, I guess. Reminds me so much of, like, a Y2K production. I talked about this already in my Songs of the Week, of course. All these songs have been Songs of the Week as well, so... You might have heard me talk about these songs specifically, but I guess it's more like a general roundup, right? La creme de la creme. <laughs> what am I even saying? But Beaches is just um, finding your peace in the right place, in the right environment, in the right um, location, I guess. So Biba be here, she talks about finding... Like, everything makes sense when she's on the right beaches, she says. Like, um, days blend to one when I'm on the right beaches. And, um, you know, what is it? The, the, the walls painted white to tell me your secret. Don't wait till uh, the tide to just uh, dip your feet in. Uh, so she's saying just like, you know, she's just like capturing this like feeling of um, 
you know, feeling like everything makes sense and like in the right place, you feel relaxed and at your like at your best, basically, like as like you know, in the best mood ever, basically, right? And it's so personal to me because I relate to that so much as well. I come from a very small coastal town in Italy, and sometimes when I'm like here in the city in London, I just like keep on thinking that I would love to be on my beach in my hometown, not specifically my hometown, but that like coastal uh, scenery, I guess, that I was so used to seeing when I was younger. And I do recognize whenever I'm there that whenever I'm like on that beach or like any sort of beach, like coastal um, scenery of my hometown, I guess, I feel like none, none of my worries are there anymore. Like I feel so, you know, at ease. It's just an interesting track. I don't think I've ever listened to a song that like puts into words what I've felt for so long. Like I have such a deep connection to the beach and to like, you know, the 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 sea and everything. I just like because the way it was brought up, where I was brought up as well. So whenever I'm in like that specific, you know, scenery in that specific beach, I just feel like I'm at my best. I'm like you know, all the worries are out of my brain and in my mind, and just like I'm just careless basically, which is like an incredible feeling. And plus, I just love the way she sings this. It's very like you know earnest and very like you know genuine and um pure i don't know just like very beautiful i just love the vocal delivery here she just does her fucking shit so yeah and we are done with that now before we get okay now we're getting to the last three songs i'm gonna get the two k-pop songs out of the way and then i'm gonna get to the last song that i was talking about at the beginning of the episode that like prompted me to do this entire episode um but let's get into the k-pop tracks first Forever by Baby Monster. This is just like probably my. I think uh, like looking at the stats, this is my most replayed song, a song of the year, hands down. Like I've replayed this song ever since it came out, nonstop. Even to this day, even today, I play. I think I play it every day at least three, four, five fucking times. It's just like I'm not getting tired of it. And when I when I heard this song. The feeling that I had, hands down, was the same feeling I had when I listened to Fancy by Twice. Like, it's it was a song pivotal in a sense that it's one of those rare cases where you keep on listening to that song and you can never get tired of it. You can never get tired of it. So, that's the masterfulness of this track, in my opinion. Just like a very personal note. But on a more objective note, I think what makes the song very special is, firstly the ingenious ingeniousness of this song like the way it's uh, produced it's just so interesting it combines so many different genres into one song it goes into edm it goes into trap it goes into like um um i guess like latin beats like reggaeton sort of um and it goes into a bit of a ballady bridge as well and it's just you know so freaking good like so unheard of and and it also has a bit of a house i guess type of production in the pre-chorus as well but like i find it crazy how like cable producers are not like more famous globally i guess because i cannot find in terms of production anything as complex and like so innovative as k-pop like k-pop literally keeps they're still well you could still argue that now k-pop is not the same thing as it was like in third gen or second gen where it was truly so authentic to its own roots like it's getting of course westernized but i think you can still find some producers who give you that k-pop feel that is just um unmistakable i guess and that's why i still stand any YG group that comes out, and I still very much stand any SM group that ever comes out. I think it's because, like, they, these two, like, specific um, labels put out a lot of great music that is still very much authentic to their roots. Like, SM and YG, you can say whatever you want about them, the way they, like, handle artists and all that stuff, but they still commit to, like, you know, having their own sound, their own very recognizable 
trademarked sound and also keep on pushing the envelope for what is possible in K-pop and not succumbing to like I guess the westernization of music which is definitely what's been taken the fun out of in my opinion from the hype groups like specifically I don't know everything now in the hype sounds so western adjacent like uh, what is it? Cat's Eye, I'll It, even Eugene started sounding, they, all of them started sounding all the same, like the same, like, you know, our Western R&B and all that. So, I am glad that, you know, there's still a lot of variety in other labels as well. So, Forever is just incredible. Plus, I think one other layer to the song is that it reminds me so much of uh, 2010 EDM, like a Pitbull or like um, a Florida type of track. Um, and it just has that, I guess, by, uh, I guess, like, the byproduct of that is that it reminds me so much of those years. And so it has a very um, nostalgic feel to it in some way. Like, it's just crazy. Like, it's a very innovative song, but it's also like, oh... This feeling, I feel like, you know, I've heard it before, or something like, you know, I felt before, and it's just incredible. Um, and the chorus is just so good, vocal delivery, the, the melodies and everything. Outstanding, the ad-libs and the key change in the last chorus, magical. The rap part, incredible. The trap beat, superb. Um, and again, I just had, like, it's just so, so much fun. So much fun. That's a fun thing about K-pop. That really brings me to so much joy. Um, and now, the next song is Supernova by Aspa. Um, second to last one. The song that I'm going to talk about. Supernova, Very as I was saying, in a very similar vein, this has that fun and innovative element of K-pop that I've been missing. And it's been definitely very much needed in K-pop. And that's, like, this, coincidentally, is also the song that made, um, that's been making Aspa so famous and dominating the charts in Korea. Like, they've, they're still standing strong for this song. Korean um, audiences love it. And I think what's really interesting about this, is, this song specifically is that it's one cohesive song as well, but it just keeps on being different every step of the way. Like, it keeps on adding elements here every now and then. And it just culminates into this like incredible production, incredible delivery as well. Um, there's this very snappy snare uh, or clap. I don't know what it is specifically, but that uh, like it's throughout the entire song and it's just so infectious. And the way it's done is just masterful, I guess. Um, and then you know there's bits and pieces where like it's a very um, like synthy and then there's a lot of like um how to say like alien sort of like sounding sound like sound, sounding elements in this song like it's very cool um and then there's a bit of like that guitar distorted guitar and just everything and then the beat switch in the bridge uh, um it's just incredible shit like the beat drop is just a completely different vibe it's incredible like if you haven't heard the song just go listen to it um if you like hyper pop i guess you could like this one even though i wouldn't say it's like specifically hyper pop but it's that type of busy production that you would like if you like hyper pop that makes sense but it's still very k-pop still very um very cool so yeah kudos to us as well like they're doing that shit we tried to get tickets today for the concert in london didn't work bitches fuck y'all <laughs> it was so difficult i don't think i've ever experienced something this difficult just i think it's just a axs and um ticket master war shit at selling things we went on the uh <laughs> on the pre-sale as well and they paused the queue while we were at it like my friend was right ahead of me and she got kicked out she got to the selling point basically but then the link stopped working so y'all need to be taken down fuck y'all <laughs> damn <laughs> anyways um last song and then i'll get into the albums oh my god i'm so <laughs> i am so far behind 49 minutes oh my god this is gonna be a long one i don't care my vision is clear i keep on doing this to myself 
last song and the song that made me this is the song number 10 uh, the song that made me get into this whole thing shebang was Chloe or Sam or Sophia or Marcus by none other than Miss Taylor fucking Swift Taylor Allison Swift you did it again you have I've done yourself once more and the the best thing about this track is that first of all didn't really pay attention to it for the first four fucking months when the album came out and then something happened I don't know what it was just clicked for me I don't know it rather me came on and I was like oh 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 my god, I'm having manifestations, like, I'm understanding things. Here, I know what's going on now. Now, um, this is a piano ballad, and it may, be, it may not be, like, the cup of tea for everyone, I guess, but I just love a... Is this Aaron Dessner? I think it might I think it is Aaron Dessner. Um... But it's just a heart-wrenching song. I would say this to me should have been the track five on the album, on the standard edition, in my opinion. This is really the what a track five does best. I think it's um, it communicates a very low point in Taylor Swift's um, story, I guess, in this album. But also, at the same time, it really encapsulates, I guess, the entire relationship. And if you, have, if you didn't know about it, this album is about Matty Healy and most songs are about him and this song specifically is the best track at describing the entire relationship and what basically like, it explains so well and so poignantly why she's so hurt by this whole very short-lived romance with Matty Healy like what broke her heart specifically about this whole thing and it's such a such a well constructed and um lyrically poignant song is just i think it's taylor swift that are her finest i'm sorry but if you don't get the song it's um time that you get into it you know uh so first of all the title chloe or sam or sophia or marcus is, is i was like when i first read it, it was like what the fuck is that but it's actually very smart it's just random names that she disputes about when she refers to the possible different people that Maddie uh, has been with, basically, while they are not together anymore. So she starts off the song literally by saying, Your hologram stumbled into my apartment, hands in the air of somebody in darkness named Chloe or Sam or Sophia or Marcus, and I just watched it happen. So she's reminiscing about, you know, him... In the past, when he first met, going through these many people and her not having, you know, any balls to actually, you know, approach him. And, you know, she just watched. She was just a bystander. She didn't have the strength to, to, like, just approach the guy, basically. She just, like, let him rock with the many people he went through uh, in these years, basically. And... That is, first of all, already a crazy way of opening a track, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah. But I want to bring up the lyrics so I can like better go into it. And then she goes into the second part of the first verse. As a decade would play us for fools, and you saw my bones with someone you knew, who seemed like he would have bullied you in school. And you just watch it up. So the first half of the verse is her perspective, seeing him with many different, um, you know, people. But then the second part flips it over and says, um, you know, this past decade, when after we first met, you also saw me, my bones out with somebody. The way she says, like, you saw my bones out with somebody new who seemed like he would have bullied you in school. Um it's like it's flipping over inside and she's saying, Well, you just also just watch it happen. Like we both played our own games with our own different, you know, partners, but none of us had the balls to like actually make this happen, right? But it underlines basically this um hidden feeling that they both were wondering or at least she was wondering about 
you know, him this whole time, this past decade. Because if you didn't know, they first, like, got in touch in 2014. And whatever happened between them in 2014 never actually went anywhere. Like, it never actualized into anything. So we now know that the main reason why she went back to him after breaking up with Joe Alwyn was because she's she had been wondering this whole entire time about him and it's such a heartbreaking thing because then we get into the rest of the song now she understands then that this whole like you know this whole decade of wandering basically just led her to meet someone again who is not instead you know in love with her anymore right he was just in love with her with a past version of herself that he made in the first place in 2014. They, they meet again 10 years later, and then he realizes that, oh, this is not the same person that I fell in love with in the first place. So, that's so sad. That's so sad. That's so sad. Oh my god. I don't want <laughs> to get emotional, but yeah. Um... And it, go, it goes into the chorus. If you want to break my cold, cold heart, just say I loved you the way that you were. That's what I'm talking about. If you want to tear my world apart, just say you've always wondered, right? So that's that's what she's basically... She's She's been thinking this whole time, right? You know, at least, you know, you've put me through these motion, emotions this entire decade. We've been wondering about this. And then we finally, you know, finalized it. Like, we made it happen. But then it lasted for such a fleeting time in right now and then you just left me without saying anything so just like at least if you want to break my heart forever just tell me that you've always like that you've always wondered that you you loved me just the way i was not the way i am right now so if you want to really hurt me say you loved me but just for the way i was before right second verse she says you said some things that i cannot absorb you turned me into an idea of swords you needed me but you needed drugs more and i couldn't watch it happen and then she says, I changed into goddesses, villains, and fools, changed my plans and lovers and outfits and rules, all to outrun my desertion of you. And you just watched it. So basically she's saying, like, you know, this whole time he was wondering about her because he turned her into an idea that was far from reality. Like, in the meantime, she changed throughout this decade, but he kept on having her in his mind as if she was so stuck in 2014. And, um... Yeah, then when they, you know, met up again, he realized very quickly that that wasn't the same person anymore that he fell in love with, and he couldn't pursue this. Oh my god, that's so sad. Um, and then I got into the chorus, and then he goes in, she goes into the bridge. If the glint of my eye traced the depth of your sigh down the passage in time, back to the moment I, trace, I crash into you, like so many wrecks do, to impair my, my youth, to know what to do. So she kept on saying, she goes back and saying, like, oh, I never couldn't do anything i never could do anything back in the days with you because i was so impaired by my youth and i was so you know we were basically like two ships passing by we couldn't you know made it work back then and then the, the the last part of the song is just where it takes me to another crashing point verse three she says like so if i sell my apartment and you have some kids with an under a starlet Will that make you your memory fade from the Scarlet Maroon? She, she reveals that her song and Midnight's Maroon was about him as well, in my opinion. Crazy shit. Um, could it be enough to just float in your orbit? Can we watch our phantoms like watching wild horses? Cooler in theory, but not if you force it to be. It just didn't happen. So if you don't break my cold, cold heart, say you love me. And that's it. She said, like, she just... <laughs> it's too much. It's too much. But this song is just lyrically exquisite exquisite and just um the vocal performance the melody and everything that which she just sings the last score specifically she's just so heartbroken you can tell and she's just so depressed and girl i get it i get it i remember actually like listening to this song when i actually when it actually clicked for me i literally i, I cried to the song like I, I couldn't help myself like it's so sad it's so especially if you know the lore i guess but also if you don't like if you just like listen to an entire song without knowing any context i think you cannot still understand so perfectly the sort of relationship she was in like she's such a good storyteller for a reason i think so even without the context you can actually tell what the song is about but yeah crazy anyways these are the songs of the 
for now, basically, of my current list of my favorite songs. Uh, how many minutes am I in? Oh, one hour. Shit. Okay. Let's uh, speed this through. Let's get into the top albums of the year. As of now, I guess. These are ranked. Oh my god. Um, I will start with like number five, which is Cool by Hyalin Chu. This is the only EP on the list. Everything else is an album, but I had to include this one. This is such a cool, 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 cool. Okay, yeah, for, actually, before I get into the actual album, I need to, like, explain how I picked these albums. I think my, like, uh, my, I guess, like, method in choosing these, like, uh, albums was to focus mostly on how I, like, if I can sit through them in one go without having to skip possibly any of the tracks, like, if I can sit through the entire album, then that's already an incredible sign that the project itself, in my view, is very successful and, like, one of the better ones, but also the replay value is also very important here, I guess. And if I have attachments to any specific songs and if I find so many highlights in one album, then I'm like, oh, these are the best albums of this year. So, yeah, that's how I chose these uh, these albums. The first one I was saying was Cool by Yelling Ju. It's an EP, so she has a bit of an advantage, but I'm putting her fi- f- fifth at least b- because of that, basically, because she doesn't have any more songs than five, basically. So it's just five songs, but I think it's very cohesive as an album, as an EP, sorry. And it's a very carefree listen, I guess. It's very, like, Korean R&B and... Has a lot of like uh, snares that are like eighties um, and seventies, I guess, in, throughout the entire like project. And I think the very distinctive sound here is the the piano in these songs. Like there's, I think in most most of the songs there is this piano that is very like staccatoy and very unique. And I don't know. I think it's such a like cohesive um, project that is just like so easy to get like immerse yourself into it's just very carefree puts me in a very good mood and it's just a very, like something that i like find myself returning to every now and then because i really really enjoy the 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 mood it puts me in unfortunately lyric wise cannot really you know tell you much because it's korean and i, I mean i don't when i listen to k-pop or like korean songs i don't really dwell into the um lyrics of it all but i just like approach it by the sonics and the production so that's that but um cool by behind you go give it a go go give it a go <laughs> girl i'm done like that that breakdown of chloe or someone your mark has sent me to a fucking spiral <laughs> but i'm still experiencing whiplash powerful whiplash but um yeah uh cool by behind you incredible fucking track <laughs> Sorry, incredible um, EP. Give it a go. Now, number four is drum roll. <laughs> that was so weak. Brought by Charlie XCX. Now, um, duh. Like, I think it's no secret that Brat is. Of, like one of the strongest projects of the year it may not be as commercially viable as many people would like you think it is but we're not talking about um you know sales or whatever like we're not talking about that metric whatsoever um here we're talking about the the art piece the I guess the the sentiment, the the vision that the artist wanted to like express here, and I gotta say, Brat is probably the best executed album that Charlie XCX has ever put out, and I think it's impressive how it read the culture in such a specific way that this album was needed, I think, by specifically the youngsters and like people in their twenties, I guess as well. Like, I would say like the covid generation i would say needed his album so bad 
I think I talked at length about this album in so many different episodes as well, in my recession pop episode as well. But the main th- thesis that I have about this album is that it read the need for people to like experience um, club life again and like going out and like being a bit, you know, the dirty girl aesthetic that is just, you know, like embodying the brat, the brat aesthetic, basically, right? Just being a bit bitchy, a bit uh, against the rules and like being so intense and so cunty, but also at the same time lashing out because you're emotionally very insecure and very, um, you know, inexperienced in that sense, if that makes any sense. And like, there's so many conflicting things going on in your life. So there are so many great tracks, so many great um, runs, I guess, here. And I think what really elevates the, the entire era, I guess, or like the entire phenomena is also the way she just very smart, like, uh, very, you know, ingeniously, I guess, she brought in different artists to do remixes of the songs. So they gave a new spin to, like, to, a new spin to, like, these new album. So, incredible stuff there. But I think, just in general, that it's a very cohesive-sounding album. And I think she had us fooled with the, with the track run in terms of releases, because the first few tracks that she released of the album before the album came out were all club bangers and about like club and partying and all that stuff but then when the album came out th- most of her songs were instead about a lot of more like personal and like emotional type of uh content like for example a uh, girl so confusing uh, how difficult it is to be like a um, female entertainer and like um how she's forced to like be put against um pitted against like another female artist in this case lowered and then we also have sympathies and i which is another one or like um everything is romantic um it's about you know reminiscing about a very specific moment in time where you felt pure love and peace in a sense and i think that was inspired when she went to italy like there were so many different you know iterations emotive iterations i guess of the broad aesthetic and it just like worked so well and i think sound wise what i was saying basically is that it's such a high you know paced um fast paced album and such a you know clubby type of um production that it just reignited the passion in so many people to like go out and experience nightlife once again which was very much needed everyone was like thinking about it but no one actually had the, the bravery i guess to like go that far and i think in a way also is just you know the perfect combination of charlie being charlie but also honing her craft and being at her best basically right my favorite track i would say on this album it would either be back to back um so b2b or club classics i love that song so much um, I do like Everything is Romantic, to be fair. Um, it's a very cool track. Um, I love the Guess uh, remix with Billy Eilish, to be fair. Like, I think it adds a, li- a little bit of an extra layer that, layer that it really, you know, gets the song going. Von Dutch is incredible, but I think overall my th- favorite favorite might be Back to Back, which is maybe an unpopular opinion, but... That song slapped. But yeah, kudos to Charlie. The entire phenomena was just, uh, hands down, so well executed. And can't wait to see what happens now with the remix album. I think Ariana Grande has been rumored to be on there, which is insane. Oh, yeah, the 1975 was also rumored to be there. So that's interesting. I don't know what's going to happen there, but yeah. Cool, cool stuff. Now, number three is Eternal Sunshine by Ariana Grande. Ariana Grande. Um, I was very much surprised to see that this is my most streamed album of the year in terms of album. Um, But also, at the same time, I'm not surprised because I really, really like this album. And I have to say, it may be one of my favorite albums by Ariana Grande ever. Like, ever. Um, 
I think this is like so Ariana, but also so not Ariana. As I was saying with um, don't want to break up again. Like this is a very vulnerable side of Ari and a very well executed concept album as well. Because as I said, like my I've also made an episode on this on Eternal Sunshine itself, like bringing out each each track. So I'll try to be as like sweet and short as I can. But this album literally is based off of um. A Jim Carrey movie. Jim Carrey, was it? I think so. Um, it called also Eternal Sunshine, but the entire point of the the, um, the track is of the album basically is to talk specifically about this relationship that couldn't quite work out. And there's, you know, it's always going to be her Eternal Sunshine in the sense that she's always gonna, even though it like, caused so much pain in her. It's still, she's always going to be reminded of this person anyways. Like, it's going to be a learning lesson for her. And it's something that she's going to try and, you know, look back on with fondness, basically, right? Like, instead of simply, you know, discounting it as something that didn't work out. She goes into, like, all the, you know, different stages of, like, having to break up with this person. And, um, you know... No, no, like, it, the entire feeling throughout this uh, entire album is uh, knowing that this person is not good for you, and the difficulty, I guess, of, like, breaking up with them and moving on at the same time, right? So this whole, like, journey of accepting, I guess, the end of a relationship and then moving on. And I, I think another thing that I really liked about this album is the way it sounds... And the Max Martin production is just impeccable as usual. And I loved how she got into so many different iterations of herself. Like she went into a house um, production with Yes And. And then she went into like the R&B um, with Supernatural and uh, True Story and The Boy's Mine, you know. And then she went to like some of the ballads and some of the like slow down songs like I wish uh, wish I hated you, and you know all that. And there's just so much good stuff on here. It's just I think sonically so cohesive as well. It just works together so well. And I don't know. I really liked it. I think I really liked the concept of it all. The way it's like tied to this movie as well. And I think. Is just so beautifully done. I think he's also Ari's also in this album, like um, how to say, controlling herself in terms of vocals. She's not really doing like too much in terms of like high notes and or whatever. Like she's she'll she, she, you know, she still does a lot of great things, but it's not the usual uh, run for Ariana where she goes she pops off vocally because I think what she really wants to portray here is the lyrical content of the album and the the message of the album itself it's more important than the the vocal performance for her here and it's definitely appreciated i think because i think it really makes you pay, pay attention to the content and the substance and the melodies and everything but she still slays vocally so yeah like kudos to ari like she eats it down she serves vocally incredible stuff um but yeah, favorite track, favorite track, favorite track is "Don't Wanna Break Up Again," as I said. But also, I think "We Can Be Friends" is a highlight for sure. Supernatural, I loved it. I think every single track here, I just can like, I can listen to this entire album without getting tired of it. Like, I can just go from start to finish and just be like so satisfied with it, and just you know going through the entire motions. So, yeah, great, great fucking uh, work. Period. Um, album, okay, here we, here is where we got, you know, these two albums, I knew immediately they had to be number one and number two. So number two is Bird's Eye by Ravin Lene. Um, and it's not a really well-known album, I guess, but it's such a breath of fresh air, I would say. Like, I've never heard such an interesting project before. Um... I think vocally it's so unique the way she sings. It's just like a very um like high pitched but also soft uh way of singing. It's just incredible. I don't know, I don't know how she does it, but I think borderline this album is like fully R and B but 
what is unique about it is that most of the songs are not like synth produced like i think most actually maybe one with the exception of one or two tracks all the others are made with like a guitar either acoustic or electric guitar so there's like these very interesting elements in here um she might have been very much um how to say like inspired by sos by sisa maybe with the songs that she made there with the acoustic guitar and everything but it's so good so polished so innovative um there's as a, there's a lot of mixture here of between like you know acoustic guitars electric guitars there is one song that is also very much reggae which is incredible and um a lot of you know bass as well and like actual like you know instrument um and again as per the previous albums i could just listen to this front to back the in the first track as well opening up is just probably one of my favorite tracks as well on the album genius so good so so good i already talked about this in my previous episodes on songs of the week but incredible fucking shit so good she's incredible um and i think the general tenant of the album is that i mean the entire thread i guess that connects the all the songs is her going back and forth it's a bird's eye view of this relationship right it's her going back and forth um with this person like um even the intro track genius is just basically saying we always come around it don't take a genius to figure it out like what's wrong with slamming the doors like you know we have our low moments but we always like go back to each other basically right and that's pretty much the entire feeling throughout this entire album like knowing this person is not really good for you and you keep on breaking up with them but then you just like cannot for whatever reason get them out of your head and you instinctively go back to them and just get back to to that so like she has tracks like love is blind love me not that are both about the you know sort of the same feeling of like you know even if this person is treating you, this person is treating you, you know, this person is treating you like shit <laughs> i need to just like you know slow it down sometimes but <laughs> even if this person treats you like shit you cannot help yourself but love them and love is blind and then love me not is just sort of the same iteration but in another perspective i guess um or she's basically like that you know she keeps on wondering about this person and she keeps on thinking about them and wanting them be like to be, wanting them to be close to them but then she knows that this person doesn't love them crazy crazy shit um and then i think days is the closing track for example goes into the end of it basically like um you were a part of me what do you lose um so he's just like you know think reminiscing about like you know the entire relationship and like saying you know what i'm so lost now without you basically it's just like it doesn't end on a positive note to be fair so it's very sad but i love 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 the way she sings in this track and in every other track i think what really stands out apart from the production as well as i said and the way it's like uniquely r&b but also acoustic -y and like guitar heavy as well um is also the incredibly innovative way she like comes up with like choruses and like melodies in the choruses is just like so captivating i think it's like basically applying the r&b type of like formula in choruses and pre-choruses and verses but then applying them to like a production is completely non r and and it's just exquisite exquisite so yeah like this is my second favorite album of the year i'm not kidding this is like real shit so freaking good please listen to it if you want to maybe get into the album listen to genius listen to love me not listen to maybe listen to uh days if you want something to slow down listen to from scratch but everything is just so cohesive in this album and it's just so beautifully executed and just again it just 
get stuck in your brain the way she sings the way she comes up with Melly is just so impressive kudos to her just wild wild well shit and to close it off my uh, favorite album of the year is Charm by Clearo girl this album is just pff, fucking insane I think what really works best here is that it really takes me back to um, Immunity, the album that she did, the first album, and her what really made her famous in the first place with like blouse and bags. And I think really the pitchfork, the pitchfork uh, review of this album really encapsulates what made this album so strong as well. Is that it really captures what she was best at in her debut album, but then updates it and merges it with the sounds that she then grew up to love and like producing the next few albums. So maybe the other albums that she did were not as like you know artistically um, identifiable in terms of Clara. Like it, it, she lost a bit of her identity in the other album in, in other albums. But I think she found herself back into this so well. It's just so good. Um, so her writing is just at her best year, I think. What Claire is most famous for is basically, you know, ma managing to like, um, you know, focusing on like a little moment and then from that on create an entire picture of, you know, of a feeling. Like, so she goes from, like, a very um, mundane, I guess, object or, like, fact or appearance or encounter. And then from that, she builds this entire feeling from it that is just so inexplainably accurate. It's just insane. Um, and Claro named this uh, album Charm specifically because she wants to portray, um, basically moments where she was charmed or fleeting moments that's what she said like she, she wants to portray fleeting moments where either she's been charmed or she's felt charming right and you can basically like you know found these fleeting moments in all the tracks um like for example um glory of the snow uh, she starts off this track literally by her looking back on her back uh, on, the, on the back seat and from then on she's pulled literally in like uh, for a thread of memories and she starts reminiscing about the entire relationship and it's just so beautiful to to to, to hear and to like you know understand the lyrics is just so like so special i guess i don't know i just don't know how to explain it. it's just like such a good way of writing insane stuff um or she, for example, conjures like this fleeting moment of, of like meeting up with this Juna girl. You want to make me go buy a new dress, and you want to make uh, you want to you make me want to slip off a new dress, right? Um, there is a uh, an underlying sexiness to the entire record. This like very um, sensual energy here that was not found. Well, it was found a bit before, I guess, in previous records from uh, by Clara, but I think here is just like a very so like you know underlying theme of the album as well or on sexy to someone she says as she goes into like um this fleeting moment of like her feeling you know like she wants to be appreciated by someone sexually as well like she wants to be to feel like she is charmed and she is charming as well and um she just wants to feel sexy to someone it's not it's all, every, all, all every, that she really wants and it's just like this um you know random thought that goes into her brain randomly and then it spins into an entire an entire song so um yeah incredible stuff i think also what i really loved if uh, uh pitchfork um review of this because it was such a good way of putting it like um i think what was her name um oh my god what was the name of the, of the author of this one Marisa, uh, Mar Marisa LaRusso, I think she went into this and she said um, that this album is 
golden hued all over basically and her voice on here comes across more like a murmur in a crush's ear than a sheepish mumble on a first date she's like entrancing you in her songs and like seducing you in some di so many different ways and i think what really takes it to the next level apart from like the the way she sings and the way she's um portraying these like fleeting moments is also paired so well and so exquisitely by the production which is very 70s palette in that sense and like very soft rock and surprisingly a lot of R&B I was so shocked by the way like so many of these tracks are like actually very much R&B um, and some of the others are like very groovy like um, Sexy to Someone is very groovy or Out of My Love is very groovy as well that's my favorite track by the way Out of My Love incredible stuff um so yeah like kudos to um you know what's his name leon leon michels he's the main producer of this album kudos to him he i think expanded on what she did in the previous album so well like on um on you know uh on, on Sling and her previous album, she was very much doubling into the like, 70s production, but it was very folk, folky, I guess. While with um, this, it's more like she's getting into that Beatles bag sometimes, or like that John... Um, what is it? John, yeah, that John Lennon like type of it all. Like um, She's just getting into that like you know 70s um, type of groove, you know? And I just loved it. Like... I keep on listening to this album every now and then and I know I can sit through the entire thing because it's like so cohesive and just like puts me into like such a specific mood as well like a very whimsical type of uh, feeling and it's just unforgettable I think it's one of the best uh, albums of this year uh, hands down and yeah like literally it's just such a an incredible experience. I urge you to go and listen to it. But um, yeah, she's so alluring. She's so captivating in in the way she sings here. The way she talks about these like very mundane moments that sp uh, spun into like this entire you know reminiscence on feelings and fleeting you know in past relationships and um, love and you know needs and like all these very humane emotions as well it's just incredible like so so charming girl i've been charmed claro you did that you charmed me real bad but yeah and with that we end the episode one hour and 30 fucking minutes <laughs> i'm so sorry but we had to do this i was so inspired so i had to simply do it and yeah that's pretty much it hope you guys enjoyed the rest of your week and I'll start the playlist um, of the month with the next episode, I guess. Yeah. So, bye. Bye.